ask if you would take your copy of God's Word and join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll be looking at verses 50 through 58 as we preach through, continue preaching through this letter and coming to the end. Some of you are probably like, thank God, it's been forever. I know, but we are getting closer. In the Bible, we find really all throughout that there are various people who live for the present age, and they kind of go all in on this present age, and then you'll see some examples in the Bible who kind of forsake this present age, and, and they kind of live for this age that is, that is coming. And In fact, you can really look across uh, our world today and find those same kind of examples. I was kind of reading an article uh, here recently about a guy who had hit the lottery. He had received like $180 million and and uh, bought like this amazing ranch and, and house and uh, for around like $5 million and then like, uh, you know, started expanding it to over 800 acres. It had like a saloon, a steakhouse, uh, uh, its own house. I mean, it was it was awesome. And I was like looking at pictures and I was like, good night. Why? And then, I, you know, the article was like, he's selling this off. And I was like, well, what's he selling this place for? Who would want to sell this? I mean, they had like eight car garage and bunch and all kinds of awesome looking cars that were in there. And I mean, just looking through all these pictures, I was just, I mean, you're, it's hard not to be just super impressed by it all and overwhelmed. And, just, and I'm kind of looking like, why is he selling this? He run out of money. And I finally get to the deal and it said he was selling it. It says because he, he was bored. He got bored, and I just thought, man, you could have a little corner of this place and, and not be bored for, forever, it seemed like. And so this present age, it has a way of just not bringing that fulfillment and satisfaction, yet people will still go all in on that. There's an example in the Bible that's found in Luke of a rich young ruler. And this rich young ruler would have had an interaction with Jesus, and Jesus uh, says he loved him and wanted this rich young ruler to follow him. And, and so there was kind of something standing in the way of that. It was all, this man had wonderful and great possessions. And, and so that was really his God, his Lord. And, and, uh, and so in this interaction, Jesus says, why don't you lay that down and, and come follow me? And the guy, uh, when he was pressured to choose, he chose this age and would not, would not choose. And it says he walked away sad. Well, one of the disciples, Peter, spokesman of the group, kind of sees this. And let me read you you what he says. In Luke 18, verse 28, it says this. Peter said, see, we have left all and followed you. So he said to them, Jesus, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. He says, Peter, I know y'all left your nets for me. I know you dropped this present age behind. And God will not only reward you in this present age, but I'm calling you to serve and to live a life that is focused on this age that is coming. And I would tell you, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58, Paul is getting the, red, getting the church ready for this age that is coming. And that's what we're going to see. As, so consider these principles as we get ready as a church. We need to be ready for this age to come. And that is the title of the message this morning, the age to come. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 says this. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit corruption, incorruption. And so as Paul's getting the church ready, he says, look, there is a process that needs to be completed first. So this age to come, you're you're not really ready right now. Our flesh and blood, our body, it cannot inherit this. And so there is a process that needs to be completed. Let me kind of focus on the hearers of this for a moment. Look in the text in verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, before we go any further, if you are not found in this category as brethren, which consists of the family of God, who have given their life and heart to Jesus Christ, you are baptized by the Spirit of God and placed into God's family, you are now considered brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ. This age to come that we're going to read about, it only applies to the brethren. It is the sole focus of this whole text on this age to come. This is who this message is for, those who are in the 
family of God. And so this is a prophetic word, prophetic word for the church. And this salvation process, he, what he's saying is, it's not completed yet, but it must be completed before you can inherit the kingdom of God. So what's happened so far for the brethren? If it's not completed, where are we at in this process? And so where we're at in this process for the brethren is, what's happened so far is they have been born again. You have been born again. That's where the process really starts. But there's more that needs to come. And until that other stuff comes, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. But here's where they're at so far. They've been born again. And I'm telling you, being born again is the most crucial step a person can can experience. Because without that step, nothing else follows after that. You're not even considered the brethren if you're not born again. Let me notate what Jesus says in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, he's speaking with Nicodemus, and in verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, this leader of Israel, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5 says it again, Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, speak to Nicodemus, you leader of Israel, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, clarifying what he means by born again, the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Paul says unless the, flesh and bl- the, the body and the flesh is put off, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. But forget about inherit for a moment. Forget about inheriting the kingdom of God. If you're not born again, you're not even going to see it or enter it. So forget about inheritance. If you're not even considered the brethren, if you have not been born again, you will not see this kingdom in this age to come, nor will you ever even go in. You will not even enter it. The brethren, though, once you become a born-again believer, now it becomes an inheritance. But you will not see or enter this uh, without being born again. And the born again, and so kind of church language here that that maybe you have heard, it's a phrase right out of the Bible, though. Being born again means being born the first time as you were born and birthed through your mother's womb is not good enough. You were born with the sin nature. And so being born again, it happens at a moment. That moment you are convicted by the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit does is he tells you, look, you're not part of the brethren. The Holy Spirit will tell you, you're outside the family of God. You are not uh, in God's family. He begins to convict you and begins to point things out in your life and, and begins to show you your need for Jesus Christ. And when you respond to that, you have a human responsibility to respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And as he convicts you and begins to tell you, look, you're lost, you need Jesus, you're lost, look at your life. And as you have this kind of pressing conviction on you, and then the moment you give in to that, the moment that you say, yes, Lord Jesus, I know what I've heard is true, I've heard the gospel. And the moment you surrender into that and you say, Lord, come save me, I know that I'm a sinner. The moment that you give your heart and give Jesus the throne of your heart and you give him the throne of your life, the moment you forsake all, Born again, a reflection of being born again is forsaking all and following Jesus. The opposite of what that rich young ruler did, what the disciples did as they are born again. In that moment, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, baptizes you, regenerates your soul, cleanses you. He saves you, and it starts the process. It starts the process, and then now that you can say to someone else that's been born again, brethren, your brother and sister in Christ, you are in this family of God. It is the most crucial step. George Whitfield, a famous preacher in his day, he had a contemporary, John Wesley, both were were great preachers. George Wesley preached on being born again over and over again. They say he preached on born again over 3,000 times. So naturally, he gets critics that say, hey, George, every message is kind of the same. You're always preaching on born again. Hey, George, how come you're always preaching on born again? George, you preach another message, the 3,000th one. On born again, and so a critic asked him, "How come you always preach on born again?" And his response is, "Because you must be born again. <laughs> it is the most crucial step that you could ever take. Without being born again, this age to come, everything we're about to talk about does not apply to you. I want it to, but it does not. This is to the brethren, and so it's the most crucial, but it's still not." complete. So let's look at the hindrance for a moment. We'll see the hindrance in verse 50. Here's the hindrance. It says, now this I say, brethren, you born again believers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 
nor does corruption. And so here, here's, here's the hindrance. Flesh and blood and corruption. He's describing our body. Your soul has been made brand new. Your body has not been. Your body is hindering you from entering and inheriting this. So this body is still marred by sin. It's going to die. It must be left behind. And Paul's been trying to make this argument, and I guess he's going to keep making it until we believe it. All of chapter 15 is like, you've got to put this off before that you can inherit the kingdom of God. It must be left behind. Now, inherit's an important word. You see it in this verse twice, inherit. And inherit's a family term. You see inherit... Uh, through in the Old Testament, as as lots were passed down, as the family tribes in Israel, there were twelve different families that make up the tribe of Israel, and the the, the grandchildren they got to inherit parts of that land based on their uh, ancestors. So this is a family turn inheritance. If you weren't part of the family, if you lived in some other nation, you weren't in this inheritance. So inherit this is to the brethren. It's a family term and it belongs what it means is inheritance something that belongs to somebody else now becomes your possession because of your relationship in that family and so if you're not in the family then what they possess doesn't belong to you that applied in the old testament but it applies to the brethren the brethren and so this inheritance the kingdom of god is an inheritance but you can't inherit that if you're not the brethren but if you are if you've been born again and guess what what God's possession is, becomes mine and yours. Those born-again believers, because our relationship to him in the family through Jesus Christ. I remember uh, Brittany and I got married. When we kind of, kind of first started dating, man, she had a really awesome truck. And uh, she did. Brand spanking new. It was 2014 at that time. Brand spanking new. Man, a 4x4. Four four. I thought, man, I never had a 4x4. Four four. This truck's awesome. Guess what happened when we got married? Married, I inherited that truck. Man, I got a sweet end of that deal, and it was really good. And I'm not ashamed to say it. I love driving it every time she lets me. She kind of got the bad end of the deal. You know what I brought to the table? I brought a corrupted 2011 Ford Escape that I had driven the wheels off. I mean, I brought something kind of bad to the table. I mean, I, you know, so she didn't really get the good end of the deal as I got. So I'm kind of bringing this, man, it's got all kinds of miles on it. Man, I, I, I barely hold them together now, I think. In fact, I think if I stop tithing, it's just going to fall apart. But I brought something bad to the table in this inheritance. We are bringing something corruptible to the table. Our flesh and our body, this, it's corruption. It cannot inherit in corruption and that's what the kingdom of god is described the kingdom of god is described as in corruption it has not been marred by sin and nothing that has been marred by sin is going to inherit it nothing that's been marred by sin is going to come into this and so everything that is old has got to be done away with the soul has been cleansed you're good there the body has not been like a seed planted in the ground, it's got to go in, but it's going to be raised in incorruption. And when that process happens, the process complete, and man, we get to go right on in to our inheritance. And baby, it's going to be really, really good. But this incorruption, the kingdom of God, it will never perish away, and it will not be marred by sin in any way like the old creation. Revelation twenty one twenty seven kind of speaks to this. Let me read it for you. It says, But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or cause an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Well, a couple things there. So right there, nothing's going to enter it that's been marred by sin. Only those, the Lamb's book of life. Well, who's in that Lamb's book of life? The brethren. Those who have been born again. Anything outside of that, outside of the family, where Jesus' blood was did not have an opportunity to apply to you because you're your unbelief you do not have this uh privilege this inheritance but our old body is not going to go in with us uh those who have died in christ so maybe you're thinking all right so kind of what's going on those who have died in christ they've left their old body behind they have And guess what? They are waiting for this process to be completed. Their body is here. It's in corruption. Man, it's it's out of public sight. Uh, It's it's that's where it's sown. But their soul is in the presence of the Lord Jesus. But one day there is going to be a reuniting with a brand new body and a soul that's come back. And this is what he's about to explain. But so we have this process that needs to be completed. This next part we got a promise that it will be completed. 
it will happen. It will happen. And so this is, let's look at this promise. Look at verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a promise that this will be completed. It's not completed right now, what Paul's saying. It must be. It needs to be because you ain't inheriting the kingdom of God until it is completed. It's not completed. It needs to be. But here's a promise that it will be completed. And this is a promise. And I'll just tell you, the promise is only as good as the promise maker, and God keeps his promises. He always fulfills his promises. In fact, his promises are much better than intentions. I heard about someone who, man, that they were growing up, and man, they had a birthday, and what their dad did for them on their birthday is, man, they, 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 they came in and, and uh, said, look, we're going to the beach. Here's a, here's a chair, here's some sand, and, and man, and here's, all, here's like even a little hermit crab. Here's, here's, some, here's some stuff to get you excited about that. And of course, that kid got excited and was like, man, I'm going to the beach. But as days went by, that year went by, no beach, just a hermit crab you're trying to keep alive, and that's it. You see, there's an intention that was never followed through on. God not only intends to do this, it's a promise, and you will never find a promise in his word that he has not already completed. And if he's completed those, guess what? We have a promise that he will complete this one. And as we wait, it's not, man, I really hope he's going to do this. I hope he doesn't let me down as other people let me down. Nope. He will never, ever let you down on a promise. He will always follow good on that. Let's look at this promise in verse 51. He says, behold, I tell you a mystery. So this promise is a mystery. And so this mystery, let me kind of define that for a moment. That a mystery, it means it's mysterion in the Greek. It's a previously hidden truth that is now being revealed. It's a secret that has been hidden for all of time up until this verse. Up until, it's now it's revealed to the church. This is for the church, the brethren. And so, I mean, this is to a letter to a church. I mean, he didn't reveal this to Israel. He didn't reveal this in the Old Testament. And it's been hidden for, for all of time up until now. And nobody would have figured it out unless God had revealed it. That's what a mystery is. You're not going to come up with this because of your intellectual uh, ability or anything else. A mystery is a mystery until God reveals it. And the secret things belong to him. And so, and, but as he reveals it, uh, it becomes this mysterion, this mystery, this previously hidden truth. And so, again, this following mystery is to the brethren. Behold, I tell you. Who's the you in that verse? The brethren. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Here's the mystery. Here's the message. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So here's the mystery. Some people will experience sleep. Some will not, but every believer is going to be changed. Here's what he means by sleep. It's a term for death. He does mean death there. Why didn't he use death? Well, he uses this term sleep because it's temporary. And this is the good news. If you're a brethren, you're a born-again believer, and, and your body goes into the ground, and someone says, look, your body's dead. No, not really. For a believer, it's sleeping. It's temporary because it's going to wake up in incorruption. It's going to wake up brand new. And so uh, the death of the believer's body is only temporary. Paul's body, right now, he's in this category. Some uh, will not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And so he is, Paul's asleep right now. He's in this category of, the, of one who has been put to sleep. You say, well, soul sleep, what's all that stuff about? First, just reject that garbage when you hear that, okay? Sleep. It's not like soul sleep. Your body is put in the ground, but that person's soul and spirit, what makes them them is not there in the ground. If they are a born-again believer, they are in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are waiting for this process to be completed. And so they're, bo- they're separated from their body. But Paul's saying this one day is going to come back together again. 
And so Paul is in this spot here. His, pre- his soul is present with the Lord Jesus. His body is still here in this earth, as with all the rest of the brethren. And let this be a comfort to you if you have someone who has died in Christ. You can know that they are in the presence of the Lord Jesus, and they are awaiting this completed process as well. He says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Some people are going to sleep. Some people are not, but both categories of believers are going to be changed. What's he mean by change? That word means transformation by exchanging one thing for another. Transformation by exchanging one thing for another. Changed means you get a brand new body. You're going to get a brand new body. You're exchanging this old, corruptible, beat-up escape for a brand new body. And you are going to get this brand new body, and it says it's written in the passive voice. Well, what's that mean? Well, it means you're not going to do this. Flesh and blood cannot, cannot do this on its own. All flesh and blood can do is die. God is the one that's going to make this happen. And I'm telling you, if you can believe the other miracles of the Bible, and if you're a born-again believer, I'm telling you, those become easy. When you see the, the saving work Jesus Christ has done in your life, you read the Bible and you read it like, man, this is truth. And if you can get on board with that, I'm telling you, then this miracle shouldn't bother you one bit at all. That God can change you in a moment. And so, uh, and it's written in the indicative mood. And when this stuff's written this way in the Greek, it means it's a statement of fact. And how else would a biblical writer write one of God's promises other than a statement of fact? This will happen. Well, how long is that going to take? Look what he says in verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. So this change is going to happen. So for those who have left their body, their soul and spirit is with the Lord Jesus and their bodies here, they're going to be raised up and it's going to happen, boom. Those who are still here, who, had, who will not experience death, when this happens, it's going to happen, boom, in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment. Paul used a word for a moment that indicates the smallest unit of time that was known to man. When he's describing this, the smallest unit of time known to man, this word for a moment is atomos. It's we get our English word atom. This, something very, very small, the smallest unit of time known to man, it's going to happen, and it may be, man, you just don't even realize it. There will be some things that we need to uh, consider. So if this is going to happen right now, so some of us, we're not asleep yet. I don't know. Maybe some of you are. I've killed you in my sermon, and I'm sorry, wake up just for a little bit. For, for most of us, we're, we're, we're alive, right? We're, we're not in the ground. We're, we're still here. So that means that could happen at any moment. We could be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Can I give some application right now for us? There will be no time to witness to your lost friends if this could happen like that when this happens. You are to be ready. If you have family, friends, there should be a sense of urgency. There should be a cry in your heart always if you really believe this will happen. If you really believe God's promises and this can happen at any moment, we should look at people differently because when this happens, you will have no time to witness. You will have no time to repent of that. You will have no time to mend relationships. If you've got a broken relationship right now, when this happens in the twinkling eye, you had no time to mend that. There's always the time to do stuff to obey God. Is never tomorrow. It's always right now. And when God convicts, how foolish we are if we ignore that. And I'm ashamed to say I've had ignored some of those, haven't you? Those promptings and the Spirit says do this, and you're like, uh-uh. No, I ain't doing it. But that's, that's a foolish mindset. We will also not have a time to start a consistent time to spend reading in God's Word. If you've always just wanted to, man, I, I want to kind of discover some of these truths that are in the Bible. Man, I, I want to understand the Bible better. Well, when's the time to do that? Right now. Because when this happens, in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment, there is no time to say, okay, now I'll start. Now I'll start reading. No. We get prepared now. And it's going to be signaled by a trumpet blast. So this twinkling of an eye, this change, we get a brand new body, there is going to be a blast from a trumpet from an archangel signaling it's time. So at that moment, here's what's going to happen when this trumpet blasts and the change. At that moment, the dead in Christ, they will be risen first. So they're going to rise from the grave first. And then they will be united with their new body. 
Their soul is with the Lord Jesus. They will come, their body comes up, brand new, and boom, back together again. The way it's intended to be. Right now, death is not the way it's intended to be. It is sad because it's, we're experiencing something that, that wasn't intended, something that sin brought forth. Those still alive, some of us in here, those still alive, will be changed into our new body and will be caught up to meet the Lord Jesus in the air in a moment, in an atomos, the at- boom, and then we are reunited with the loved ones in Christ and we will be with the Lord Jesus forever. Can I get an Amen. There's a commentary on this passage, the best commentary in the Bible on this passage, found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let me start with verse 13. So if I've killed you, wake wake back up for a moment, because this is good stuff. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I do not want you. Who's the you? He's speaking to the church, the brethren, born again. I don't want you, church, to be ignorant or uninformed. I like ignorant better. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. This is what happens, what ignorance will bring you. If you don't know these biblical truths, then you're at a funeral and it's a believer. Yes, you're going to grieve, and yes, it's appropriate. Let me say, it's necessary. You should grieve. That, it is sad. That takes time. But there is a difference with the way a born-again believer, the brethren, there's a difference in the way they grieve, and then a lost person grieves. It's different. When a lost person gr- grieves, there's no hope. There's desperation. I really hope something is, or someone is out there. Will I ever see them again? There's no hope. There's no promise to cling to. They don't know Jesus Christ. So Paul's saying, look, church, I don't want you to be ignorant lest you be found like someone outside the family and you look like them and you're grieving. Verse 14, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. If we, if you right now believe Jesus Christ died and rose again, then here it's also necessary, just as necessary, that he's going to bring those who also have placed their faith and trust in him at this moment, at this uh, reunion. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, that's us, right? Some of us, until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So what he's saying, here's the order, that one who's died in Christ, they're going to get their new body first. So if we're still alive, that's not that we're going to, we're going to come second. Verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Kind of sounds like 1 Corinthians 15, what we were just reading, right? And so this trumpet is going to blast. And then it says, and the dead in Christ will be be risen first. They're going to get their new body first. Where do we fit in? Look at verse 7. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I don't know anything more comforting to tell somebody or point them to than this passage if you have a loved one who has died in Christ Jesus. This is comfort for you. And there's a reunion that's coming. They are going to go first and then us. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So this word caught up, let me focus on this word. And there's a lot of people that kind of agree and disagree on this word caught up. But let me, you look like a bunch of people that want to be right. So this word caught up is harpazod, harpazod. And and so the, the Latin form of that word is rapio. And if you keep going, you translate that to English is where we get our word rapture. And so the, the rapture, and so may, have you heard that term before? And so whatever term you want to use, whatever wets your whistle, it don't matter. The harpazo is the original word, and it means to be taken out by force. So someone comes in and to be taken out by force. And so what Paul is saying, this we're going to be caught up. We're going to be removed. Who? The church, the brethren, those who have been born again believers will be caught up. After the dead in Christ rise first, get their new bodies, will be changed. At the, at the, in a moment, the trumpet will blast, and we will be lifted. We will be removed. We'll be harpazoed out of here, and to be caught up with them, and we'll always be with the Lord. And the implication is, together forevermore. Harpazo, this caught up. We have a biblical illustration of this, and someone actually experienced this harpazo, and his name is Philip, in his interaction with the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip was given a kind of a weird command by an angel and said, look, Philip, you need to go out in the desert in the middle of nowhere. 
Philip said, okay. He gets there, there's an Ethiopian eunuch returning from Jerusalem. He went to worship, probably couldn't, on his way back. And as Philip gets closer, he gets some, uh, some more commands as he's obeyed the first ones, which that's just the way it works. As he, he gets this other one, hey, go up on that chariot, overtake it. And as he does, this, this Ethiopian eunuch, man, he's reading this, sc- this scroll of Isaiah. And as he's reading it, he's, he asks Philip, who is this person talking about? Is, he, is the prophet speaking of himself or some other man? The text says, beginning at this scripture, he began to preach Jesus to him. And so then they, the, he stays up there with him. We don't know how long he was there for, but obviously enough time to have a, a conversation about Jesus for this man to be born again, become a, a, a brethren, and that they see some water. And he says, what hinders me from being baptized? He says, well, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Nothing hinders. Let's do this right now. And so, I mean, it, it was immediate. They went down in the water and came up. Let me show you what happens as soon as they come up out of the water. And this is found in Acts chapter 8, verse 39, says this. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. Harpazod, raptured, rapio, whatever term you want to use. He was caught up, caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Let me kind of give you a difference, though, what's going to happen. The reason why he went on his way rejoicing because he was also a born-again believer now, too. And he went on his way preaching the kingdom of God. Philip was physically caught up, removed, and then placed, it says, in Azotos, which is tw- approximately 20 miles north. I mean, that's great transportation. Maybe you didn't have planes or anything back then. It didn't even matter. The Spirit of the Lord caught him up, dropped him down as soon as he was done with that assignment. Let me make some application. Church, brethren, born again believers, I'm talking to you. What's going to happen when our assignment is over? Well, first, what's our assignment? The Great Commission. And when that last person accepts and receives Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, then that person is born again whenever that's going to be. We have no idea when. It's not even given. Uh, There's signs and stuff, but it says, look, that no one knows this hour when this is going to happen. But when it does, there's going to be a trumpet blast. And church, brethren, born again believers... In the room, you are going to be harpazoed up out of here. There will be some that are left, but they're not going to be walking away rejoicing because there is a lot in front of them that they're going to endure. But for us, we will be caught up when our assignment's done. How much more do em- emphasis, more encouragement we need to be about the Father's business. That some will not all sleep, but we will all be changed at the trumpet, in the twinkling of an eye. And so this is going to be uh, something that happens and we have no idea when. So what we're going to look like when this happens, what should we do now? We should be about the Lord's work. And that can happen at any moment. But let me, before I get there, let me look at what's going to happen when this does happen. Look back in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 54. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54 says this. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption. Notice it doesn't say if this happens. You know how the Bible treats promises? Not if. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption. I'm telling you, this promise will be completed. When this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass. Then it shall be fulfilled. The saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? So we've had a mystery. We've heard the message. Let's hear some music. Look at this music. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Some of yours just says death uh, twice. Death is where is your sting? Death, where is your victory? And so Hades just means grave. Whether it's death, grave, the same thing's going to happen. It has lost its power over us. It has lost its power over us. And so there is, the victory is completed. I had a a note here. I kind of forgot to mention. I just kind of saw this. That harpazo is used somewhere else in the form of a promise. And I didn't really see this until when I was studying. I never caught it before. But there's a promise made in John 10 that says no one is going to snatch you out of his hand. You heard that promise before? Isn't that a good one to cling to? Well, that word that's used there is harpazo. What he's saying there, no one is going to catch you away. No one's going to snatch you away from my hand or my father's. 
And that is a promise that will be completed to there is no force that can remove the brethren from his hand. And when God makes his promise complete, which he always will do, and when he makes this one, there's going to be sweet music, baby. And this, this is going to be brought forth, this fulfillment. Death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Isn't that going to be really good? It has lost its power over us never to die again. So we say, man, pat ourselves on the back, right? Man, look what we have overcome. Not at all. Look at verse 26. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We should always recognize thanks and glory where glory is due. And it only belongs to Jesus Christ. We do not come up out of this because, oh, man, I'm sure glad I handled that temptation real well. Man, I'm sure glad that, man, I was really on my own will and power to stay faithful. No, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are only more than overcomers because of our Savior. We are only more than conquerors because he has conquered sin and death and has rendered it useless and powerless over us. And this will be brought to pass when? That, that trumpet, baby, when that trumpet blows and we are changed, we will hear some sweet music, I believe. The reason is we're hindered, right? Jesus Christ isn't hindered at all. He has no hindrance whatsoever. He defeated it. I'm going to kind of point us to some scriptures in Revelation. As, at Revelation, Revelation chapter 21 kind of speaks to this. Revelation 21 verse 6 says this. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. You hear that word inherit again? Inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. Okay, that's good. What about the other group? But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, uh, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone. So if you're not a part of born-again believers, if you're not part of the brethren, that's your inheritance. That's what you got. And here, inheritance is a family term. Inheritance is a family term. What was somebody else's possession, Satan, his demons, it was prepared for them, and now becomes yours. There is no better time than to be born again today. Today, right now, do not put this off. Well, who can be born again? Look at Revelation twenty-two seventeen. And the spirit and the bride. Well, who's the bride? That's the church. The spirit and the church say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. If you're thirsty today, if God's spirit is speaking to you, don't reject that. And I'm telling you, you call out on Jesus Christ, you're born again, and welcome to the family. And it's whosoever will. May you be a part of that today. There's a last part of this verse I want to look at. 1 Corinthians 15. Y'all been doing great. It looks like some of you I hadn't killed off yet. So just one last little point, all right? Y'all good? Can you hang with me just one little bit? That or you want to hear a whole sermon on this point next week? What do you want? Well, let's do it. Let's do, all right, one more point, all right? 1 Corinthians 15. We started early, so we can go a little bit longer. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. This is the last verse. It's one of the most important in this. This is our pursuit until it is completed. We have a process that must be completed. We have a promise that it will be completed. Here's our pursuit until it is completed. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, that's a huge therefore, by the way. You heard everything we just heard. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Therefore, who? My beloved brethren. Born again believers, I'm talking to you. What's your pursuit? It is faithfulness. What do we do? Do we just twiddle our thumbs? We just sit on a pew till we hear this trumpet? Do we sit at home and watch church on TV? What do we do? No. We be steadfast, immovable until that trumpet blows, we have a pursuit. It's faithfulness. That word steadfast means seated in a fixated position, firm, 
immovable, not move from its place. It's implying persistence. It means you are in one spot and no one, no force is going to harpots you out of that spot. You are there and there is nothing, no, no trial that's going to come in your way, no relationship challenge. There is going to be nothing that comes in and moves you from the center of God's will. Well, what's the center of God's will? Notice this next part. Be steadfast, movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You will find the center of God's will when you get off your rump and get in the middle of God's work. Don't even say that again. That's where you find God's will. When you get off your rump and get to work in his church, that's where you will find it. To be anything else is disobedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. To be anything else is not steadfast. It's not immovable. To be anything else is not a mark of somebody who's been born again. To be anything else is not a mark of the brethren. But if you find yourself and there's nothing that's going to move you, man, that's characteristic of someone who's experienced a new birth. Had the Spirit of God inside them, employing their spiritual gifts in the right, proper spot in the church. And man, they're steadfast and movable. How is it measured? Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always. Abounding means over the top in the work. What's the mindset as we work? Knowing, never forgetting that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I have to admit, there's been times where I've been working for the Lord and I've thought, man, is this really necessary? I have to admit, I'm t- I'm times I've been in the work of the Lord thinking, this is hard. Or I've been in the work of the Lord and I'm thinking, what am I doing this for? But nothing is in vain. Nothing. If you believe in a God who is omnipresent, if you believe in a God who's omniscient, he sees everything, he knows everything, and all-powerful, you believe in a God that sees it all, then nothing you do, whether small or great, whether anybody sees it or not, God sees it. And you cannot outgive God. Truly, truly, he will give more in this present age and in this age to come. In fact, Jesus said, not even a cold cup of water given out of my name will go unrewarded. He sees it all. Now, there's been times in my ministry where I've seen, you know, folks that have come in, and, man, they look like they're on fire for Jesus. I thought, man, I can't wait to, man, get alongside this person. And I've had a group come through a Sunday school class that I was teaching before. In fact, JT was a part of that group. And, man, I've seen God do great things in JT's life, but, you know, he wasn't the only one there. And what kind of hurts me a lot is those people that were there and who heard the same thing he was hearing and some of them aren't even involved in ministry anymore. Some are. I went to a church a while back and saw one of them, and he was still abounding in the work of the Lord. Man, I just gave me a thrill to see that he's still doing stuff. But there are some that, man, I don't even know where they're at. You know people like that, man, that maybe used to come here and man, used to be abounding in the work, but you have no idea where they're at? That's not steadfast. That's the opposite of a being immovable. Would you be found steadfast and immovable if that trumpet blew right now? If, that, if you heard that trumpet blast, would you be found steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? As we sing this last song, let's make this commitment to give our heart, our life to Jesus Christ and to be found steadfast until he appears. Amen. The next greatest event for the church is her removal from this earth. That is the next greatest event. We're not looking for signs. We're looking for a Savior. Nothing else has to be completed before this moment happens. We are looking for a Savior at every moment. We are looking for his appearing. And Paul says there's a crown of righteousness. It's going to be given to me and to all those who have loved his appearing. Loving his appearing means that you are in the center of God's will. You are steadfast, you're immovable, you're abounding in the work of the Lord. And when our assignment's done, whenever that will be, we'll be ushered in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will see him face to face. Are you ready to meet the Lord face to face right now? Would you be ready to meet him right now? Would he find you faithful abounding in his work? Would he find you faithful? Would you be found storing up some treasures here on earth? Would you be found, maybe got a garage full of toys, 
and you've given up everything to live in this present age. Well, guess what? If you're a born-again believer and you're a brethren, we don't live for this present age. I'm not saying it's wrong to have stuff. That's fine. But what we're really going all after, it's not about this present age. We are living for the age to come. You commit right now to live for the age to come? Would you make that commitment? Would you stand with us and as we get ready to sing this last song? Maybe today God's convicted you and convinced you that maybe you're outside the family. Maybe you've never had this born-again experience and you don't know what, what, you're, what that means. I'm telling you, if you've been born again, you know it. If you don't know this idea of this moment being saved and this born again, maybe you haven't been born again. You must be born again. Do not leave here today without talking to us about that. If God's convicting you that maybe today you're not outside the fa- that you're outside the family and you haven't experienced this born again most crucial moment you could ever experience. So maybe today when we sing this last song, God's speaking to you. Once you step out of your pew, come down. We want to talk to you about that. We want to help you and point you in the right direction. Let me ask you this. Are you faithful? Or have you given it all up for this present age? Are you abounding in the Lord's work? Big, small, it doesn't matter. There are opportunities everywhere to abound in the Lord's work. They're there. Start somewhere. Maybe today you want to come and just pray and Commit yourself to the Lord. I, I want to abound in your work. I'm living for this age to come. Maybe today you, you, you were a part of the work. Man, you, you were abounding, but maybe today you're not so steadfast. You're not so immovable. Maybe today you should come back and say, God, I want to get involved. I want to get involved. Maybe your first step just needs to be coming to one of these Bible study classes we're doing on Wednesdays. We have an awesome women's Bible study, men's Bible study. We, we, there's a Financial Peace University Bible study. Man, just get plugged in somewhere and then see how God directs you from there. Why don't you just, today, before you make that commitment, I'm living for the age to come. I'm living for the age to come. Let's make that commitment together. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we give you this time in our service where we make our commitments to you. And Lord, on our own, we're, we're, we're incapable, but Lord, we pray that you would come in and and, and do a work in our heart. Lord, for some of us, it's being born again. For some of us, it's coming back to our assignment. For some of us, it's, it's joining this church. We can't abound in your work if we're not a part of a local body of believers. God, would you make the application for each one of us by your spirit? Would he speak in a very personal way, in a very real way? We give you this time and may you bear fruit for the kingdom of God, for this age to come. We're living for it now. We give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing this next song, let's commit. Let's live for this age to come. Won't you come make that commitment right now?